It's eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. Breaking news this evening, Crispin Blunt reveals he was the Conservative MP arrested on suspicion of rape. He says he's been interviewed twice and is confident he will not be charged. Police say he has been released on conditional bail. We'll get the latest for you from Westminster. Also tonight, a note of optimism over the fate of those abducted by Hamas. Qatar's senior negotiator tells Sky News that all hostages could be released in days, but only if there's a pause in the bombardment. Any escalation whatsoever is going to make our job really harder. Any escalation whatsoever. So, so we, we're, we're trying to send those messages uh, uh, to, our, to our partners and friends. We have a special report to bring you on modern slavery in the care sector, with a visa system for foreign workers being abused by criminal gangs. After warnings about bed bugs, we'll be hearing from a woman whose daughter is being treated in hospital for septic shock after being bitten by ants in their council flat. And we're going to be joined in the studio by Steve Gallant, the convicted murderer who tackled a terrorist on his first day out of prison. All that to come and much more on The UK Tonight. Well, let's start with that breaking news tonight. And Crispin Blunt has revealed that he was the Conservative MP arrested on suspicion of rape. The former minister identified himself on social media. He says he will cooperate fully with the police and he is confident he will not be charged. Let's go straight to Westminster and speak to our political correspondent, Amanda Acas. So, Amanda, um, tell us the background uh, to this story. Yes, so earlier this evening, Crispin Blunt, who's a 63-year-old MP for Rygate in Surrey, issued a statement online in which he identified himself as the subject of reports which came out this afternoon that a Conservative MP was arrested yesterday morning on suspicion of rape and possessing a controlled substance and had been released on conditional bail by Surrey police pending further inquiries. Now, in that statement, he said, I've now been interviewed twice in connection with this this incident the first time three weeks ago when I initially reported my concern over extortion. The second time was early this morning under caution following arrest. The arrest was unnecessary as I remain ready to cooperate fully with this investigation that I'm confident will end without charge. I do not intend to say anything further on this matter until the police have completed their inquiries. Now, the Conservative Party have tonight announced that he's had the whip removed and they've also asked him to stay away from Parliament. Now, MPs in this situation uh, don't automatically get banned from the estate. That's something the parliamentary unions are calling for this evening. Now, Crispin Blunt had already announced that he was planning to stand down at the next election um, last year. Um, but he's a very well-known MP. He's been speaking out in recent weeks about the situation in Israel and Gaza. He's a former chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He even served as a prisons minister um, under the coalition government. Um and this news really does top a very difficult few weeks for the Conservative Party. Yesterday, we had the news that Peter Bone, former minister, had been suspended over bullying and sexual misconduct allegations. Um, and then we had the sweeping by-election losses um, last week as well. So for Rishi Sunak, a man really trying to reset um, his uh, premiership with a big speech on AI today, this is really the last news he wanted to hear. Amanda, thank you. Two developments in the Middle East now, and Qatar's senior negotiator with Hamas has told Sky News that all civilian hostages in Gaza can be released in the coming days if there is a pause in the fighting. While Israel says it is preparing for the next stage of combat, calls for a ceasefire are growing, but they've been resisted by Israel and its allies. Qatar's Minister of State, Mohammed al Khulaifi, said that any escalation in this conflict would hamper efforts to secure the hostages' release, but he is confident that progress is being made. He spoke exclusively to our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. It is a world away from Gaza, Qatar's skyline troubled only by a rare autumn storm. But they are playing an outsized role here in the conflict by mediating the fate of its hostages. It's a very, very difficult negotiation uh, that we've been dealing with. And with this violence increases every day, with the uh, bombing continuous every day, our task has, be has become even more difficult. Qatar was instrumental in the release of the only four hostages to be freed so far, an American mother and daughter and two elderly Israeli women. There are thought to be more than 200 left behind from 25 different countries. 
yeah. trying to deliver those messages. As, as Giving his only interview since the war began, Qatari negotiator Dr Mohammed Al Khulafi says there is now the opportunity to release many more. Our target is to release all of the civilian hostages. That's what we're working on and that's what we want to achieve. We're getting there. Every day we become more hopeful of the, uh, 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 the possibility of um, uh, filling that gap and bringing the parties together. We remain hopeful. We, we do the best as we can, trying to get everyone soon, and hopefully uh, we can achieve that goal within the upcoming days. Can you talk about the mechanics of the release of hostages and, and, and how much the bombing gets in the way of that? I mean, what, what, what is the problem there? Is it, is it actually getting out to the hostages and, and, and getting them to safety? I, I think it's, it's, it's mainly the, the difficulties for us to talk to the, to the two sides. Uh, when an escalation happens and the killing of people over there, uh, it's getting more difficult uh, for us to uh, talk to the, logically, to the people uh, uh, sitting there on the, on the negotiating table. There's a catch. For more hostages to come out, the violence must pause from both sides. Is it fair to say if Israel goes in on the ground, it's going to make your job a lot harder? Any escalation whatsoever is going to make our job really harder. Any escalation whatsoever. So, so we, we're we're trying to send those messages uh, uh, to our to our partners and friends. It's very important that everyone participate in this. Everyone should ask and seek uh, a level where uh, uh, we could achieve even more out of this uh, this conflict. There must be a reprieve in the fighting to let in more aid. They say, if not, Gaza's humanitarian situation could become catastrophic. I think, I think it's going to be a disaster. I think it's going to be a disaster. It's, uh, the situation over there is, is, is really horrible. The lack of water, food, medicine, uh, fuel to, to, to generate the energy over there. It, it, is, it is not uh, going to help sustaining the situation. They are bracing themselves here and across the region for escalating conflict. But hoping for some kind of lull to let diplomacy still have a chance of working. Dominic Waghorn... Sky News, Doha, Qatar. Well, meanwhile, for the people of Gaza, life gets more desperate by the day. Aid is painfully slow to arrive, no one can leave, and nowhere is safe. Dr Ahmed Abu Fol is a surgeon from Birmingham. 16 members of his family are trapped in Gaza, including his elderly parents and eight children, one of them a baby, just four months old. Well, Ahmed has been watching and waiting for updates and for any news that could help bring them home. Ahmed can go days without hearing from them. He hopes for the best, but naturally fears for the worst. Feels like such a glib question, but how are they right now? It's very bad. It's a very bad situation. Um, so there are eight adults and eight children. I think their main worry is the children uh, and that's my main worry. I, I worry about all of them. But when I speak to them, they hardly talk about themselves. Mm. They only talk about the little ones. We've got a four-month-old child trapped there in the same one-room basement in the middle of nowhere uh, in Rafa. And, and the, the, the eldest child is seven years old. We're talking about eight children mm. between four months and seven years old. And that's the main worry. That's, that is our main worry. Yeah. The stress is unimaginable because, you know, it's, it's bad enough worrying about the adults, but it's the children as well. I mean, the, the pressure on them must be immense. Talk to me about how this whole thing started. When Hamas attacked Israel, things moved pretty quickly and your family did try to leave. Talk me through what happened. Yeah. So from the first day, we knew that this was going to be a big and bloody conflict. So all of us, we agreed as a family that it's best to leave. And we planned, and we planned it, and we arranged for exit day three. Rafa crossing was still working. I think lots of foreign nationals tried to get out and managed. For us, we tried to, you know, to get the passports, to get everyone. I'm talking about 16 people, lots of logistics, mm -hmm. getting documents, travel documents, valuable stuff, all, all of that. So they managed to get into three cars and to move down from our house in, in Gaza City to Rafah Crossing. And just before arriving there, like 10, 15 minutes before they arrived there, 
the Rafah crossing was bombarded and was closed, and it was closed since then. And since then, we're trying to think of an alternative and with no success. This trauma is with your family every day. Every minute of their life at the moment is dangerous, but they have to keep going for the children. They have to feed them, water them, have to try and find some kind of power source to be able to keep in touch with you so they can understand what's going on in the outside world because talking to you, you know, that's their key to the outside world, you know, the hope that they have that the situation, you know, may resolve, they may find a way out. Talk to me about their day-to-day -day life because we know that food and water is scarce in Gaza at the moment. How are they charging their phones? Yeah. How are they feeding their kids? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard. They managed to take some canned food and very, very minimal food supplies when they left Gaza, but that was around 10 or 14 days ago, so they're running out of everything. They had, two of my brothers, they had to leave that shelter, walking for half an hour, trying to find somewhere to buy anything, or even to fill a bottle of water, drinking water. I mean, these daily going out trying to find food and water, it's very scary because once you're out, anything can happen and, the, and, and if anything happens to any of them, there will be a while before the rest mm. know what happened. What's this been like for you, Ahmad? I can't even describe how I feel. I mean, for three weeks, you know, we, you know, I felt helpless because I mm. couldn't do anything. Every time I speak to them, they think that I'll be bringing some good news, that some form of an agreement will happen soon to open the border. And that's heartbreaking when I not being able to have give them nothing that news. to say. Absolutely, it's, it's very difficult. And even that thought that I might lose contact with them, I lost contact with them for at least 24 hours one day. And then I heard from the news that there was lots of bombardments around their area and people displaced people from the Gaza city were killed. And that was the scariest few hours of my life because I thought that I lost them. And then many, many hours later, I managed to speak to them and they described that it was lots of bombardments in their area. So if anything happens to them, one, I will not be able to help. Two, I will not be able to, to say goodbye or, or anything. I, I really, really can't sleep. You know, because I have to stay glued to TV to, to keep updated of what's happening. It's something that I cannot control. Oh, it's Ahmed. having a huge toll on me. Yeah, unbelievable torture for you, feeling helpless here with your family in such a perilous situation thousands of miles away. You're taking practical steps to do what you can. Um, talk to me about the kind of information assistance you're getting from the UK government, your family members of British nationals or partners of British nationals. What kind of help have you been getting, if any, at this stage? I mean, to be honest, the only thing that happened so far is that we had a portal, an online portal for all British nationals in Gaza Strip to register their presence there. And that was quick and, and that's something good that we appreciate. And I think from day three from this conflict, they managed to register their presence. And from that point onwards, we're talking about 17 days, nothing happened. Mm. I know it's very tough and very critical. And it's the discussions involving multiple par parties, like Egyptians and Israelis. But for me, as a person with direct uh, relationship to people suffering there, I can't really see why can't we put any agreement in place to open the border, get those people out. It, I mean, if we manage to get some aids in, that means there should be some mechanism to bring people out. I can't see where is that holding and I, no one is mentioning anything to us or keeping us updated. Oh, well, thank you to Ahmed for talking to us here 
on the UK tonight. Uh, we're going to talk now about the widespread exploitation of carers recruited from abroad. The agency which protects workers in England and Wales says it's now dealing with a constant stream of allegations of fraud and modern slavery because the health and care worker visa system is being abused by criminal gangs. Here's our community's correspondent, Becky Johnson. They provide a lifeline for vulnerable people and a shortage of carers in Britain means staff are needed from abroad. But Sky News can reveal widespread visa fraud and a nationwide investigation into modern slavery in the care sector. In northwest England, we found migrants knocking on care home doors, desperate for a job. We are looking for a work permit, uh, like uh, most of the care homes uh, uh, giving a work permit or uh, jobs. Inside, staff didn't want to be identified, but told us they're constantly being contacted by companies they've never heard of offering them carers. We probably get about four or five calls a day asking if we need any agency staff. And a lot of now we're phoning and offering that they'll do a free shift. And in terms of the knocks on the door from people asking for work, how often is that? Two or three times a day, I'd say. It's happening because some companies are illegally charging for work visas and then failing to provide jobs. This woman, who we're calling Mary, paid £4,000 to an agent in the north of England for a certificate of sponsorship for a full-time job as a carer. It was only after she arrived from the Philippines in July that she realised she'd been conned. Have they given you any work? No. Even single day of work, they couldn't provide, they didn't give us. Visa rules mean she's only allowed to work full-time for her sponsor and any part-time work has to also be in care. So like the people we saw knocking on doors, she's also been approaching care homes. Do you feel trapped? Yeah. Could you go back? No, I couldn't. I spend a lot of money and... My family doesn't know my situation here and I don't want to tell them. They will be upset. She's scared of the consequences of reporting her sponsor, which is why we're not naming the company. But it's one of several apparently fake agencies set up since February 2022, when the government began allowing carers in on skilled worker visas. So I think it's, it's very, very close to people trafficking. This care home owner in Milton Keynes had to pause overseas recruitment after finding out an agent he'd paid had also illegally charged a worker for her visa. What sort of sums of money are we talking about? So, so the recruiter's getting £30,000 to bring somebody over. So actually, it's probably more than the um, uh, transporters are getting for the, uh, for, for the rubber dinghies coming across the channel. A major investigation is now underway into multiple care agencies suspected of being established with the intention of exploiting workers. The sole purpose of these criminals is to use these people as cash cows. They are running businesses at a much reduced cost because they're not paying them what they're supposed to. It is our number one priority at the moment. The government insists companies operating unlawfully may face prosecution and removal from the sponsorship register. Many in the care sector believe urgent reform is needed to protect workers and the vulnerable people they look after. Well, Becky's with me in the studio now. Um, and Becky, you've had reaction to your investigation from the National Care Association, which represents carers in the UK. What have they said? Yeah, well, they've said that they're appalled by this mm. abuse, by these rogue agencies, and they say that they have been warning the government for some time that the system has been potentially open to abuse by rogue agencies. And, and as we've seen, that is happening. Of course, the government says, you know, they don't tolerate companies acting unlawfully, um, that they could face prosecution or loss of their sponsorship licence. But clearly, this is a, a widespread issue. And mm. I've been hearing from more people today since our report's been running, mm. getting in touch with me, saying that they're victims or they know of people who are victims. So you've seen a snapshot of what's going on What's happening to these people? Because they can't work, they're in a country they've been lured to on a false promise, and they're stuck. 
Well, in the case of Mary, who mm. we saw in my report, um, she has had no work at all from her sponsor company. Now, they've given her... They give her a small food allowance. Um, they put her in a shared house. But she's having to try to find... So, under the terms of these visas, she's allowed to work in care, mm -hmm. but only part-time for a company that isn't her sponsor. Now, the whole reason that she came here was to support her family back home. She had a job back home in the mm -hmm. Philippines, but she wanted to earn more. She mm -hmm. saw a job advertised. She thought this would provide a better life for her family back home. And she, she daren't even tell them what's happening to her. She's just... Um, she said she sits and cries on her own. And this is a legal route that is provided by the government to help the care sector. It's being abused by these fraudulent companies, these criminal gangs. And the people that they're bringing to the UK are either ending up destitute or they're working all hours. It's, you know, the two extremes of the spectrum. And, you know, working all hours, let's call it what it is, it's modern-day slavery. Indeed, and, and that's what this nationwide investigation that we've been told about is looking into. Mm. So it's that exploitation of workers, like the work we saw in, in my report, but also modern slavery, because there are agencies who are bringing people over, saying they're going to give them 40 hours of work, paying them for 40 hours of work a week, but actually mm. they're working 90 hours. Yeah, the scale of this, I mean, you know, it's probably just scratching the surface, really, isn't it? Yeah, now it's, it's a really, really difficult issue to get to grips with, mm. and that's because the victims themselves are often scared to speak out. Mm. Um, one, they're embarrassed mm -hmm. about what's happened to them yeah. because they feel they've been conned. They also, if they report what's happened to the authorities, then the authorities will look into the sponsorship company. Mm. Now, under the terms of visas, you can only work full-time for the company that sponsored yeah. you. If that company is shut down, they, they worry that their back. visa will be yeah. invalid. OK. All right, Becky, I know you're going to follow this story uh, and this investigation. Thank you. That's Becky Johnson, our community's correspondent. Uh, still to come here on the UK tonight, three men wielding hammers threaten onlookers as they try to steal a motorbike in Bristol. We'll have the latest as police try to, try to track them down. Uh, also ahead, shocking CCTV of children playing on a live railway line in Nottinghamshire. And... Welcome back. You're watching The UK Tonight. Here's what's on the way. We'll hear from the mum of a 14-year-old girl who went into septic shock following an ant bite in her infested council flat. And talk about getting bang for your bust. A council in Scotland could make millions from a statue that they bought for a fiver. We'll bring you more on that a little later. Now, let's take a look at some of the stories making news around the UK tonight. Two teenagers have been arrested after three hammer-wielding men were seen trying to steal a motorbike in Bristol before threatening onlookers. Dressed in black, wearing balaclavas, the group targeted a vehicle in Berkeley Square, Clifton, on Monday afternoon. Onlookers filmed the incident and tried to stop the thieves. Two protesters from Just Stop Oil have been arrested after spraying orange paint on a replica dinosaur at London's Natural History Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, that's because they're the dinosaur. The Titanosaur exhibition was closed to the public after the two demonstrators, both medics, staged this protest. The men knelt on the museum floor, displaying a banner reading, for health's sake, Just Stop Oil. They were arrested on suspicion of criminal damage. Shocking CCTV of children playing on a railway line in Nottinghamshire has been released today. The video is taking at Bingham Railway Station and it shows a child jumping onto the tracks to retrieve a shoe that had been thrown onto the tracks by his friend. More than 50 trains pass through that station every day. East Midlands Railway has released the footage, calling it deeply worrying. A 15-year-old is being treated for septic shock. She was bitten by ants in her home. Rayanne Touré is currently being treated in a hospital in West London after she was bitten in her infested council flat. Her mum, Jordan, 
So she first complained to the council months ago, and although work has been carried out, it wasn't enough to get rid of the infestation. Well, they took swabs of the bite. She had one of her bites, uh, which was under her armpit, they... Um, it turned into an abscess and they um, actually drained it out and took swabs and confirmed it is um, from an ant bite. Rayanne is traumatised. She doesn't want to come back here at all. She doesn't want to even see this place at all. It was very scary for her, scary for me, scary for her dad and people to see her the way she was. Uh, well, Jordan shared with us pictures of the bites that she suffered in their flat. Housing experts say infestation cases are on the rise as the condition of the housing stock declines and unfit living conditions like mould and damp attract rodents and insects. Well, joining me now is housing campaigner Kwejo Twinaboa. Um, Kwejo, good to see you. Um, you're on a mission mm. <laughs> to highlight cases like this and you've been in touch with, with Jordan about the condition of her daughter. Mm. You've actually seen their flat. Talk mm. to me about what it's like. Yeah, I mean, Jordan got in contact with me a few days ago um, in regards to her daughter being admitted to a hospital. And I mean, I found that quite shocking straight away. Mm. But then I read it was as a result of um, being bitten by, by bed ants. bugs. Yeah, or oh, ants, sorry, yeah. ants. And um, I hadn't seen a case as serious mm. before. Um, and she had said that she'd complained in the past and was really shaken up and, and, and quite fearful what was going to happen to her daughter. Um, but she said she's had multiple issues. She's had the ants, she's had damp and mould, disrepair. She's lived there for 15 years. I um, mean, she was told it was going to be temporary. Um, but I was, as soon as I saw it, I, I, I was very, very worried um, because it was the first time, again, if, if things were a lot worse and mm -hmm. it didn't turn out um, to be how it's played out, it could have been a lot worse for her and her, her, her daughter, unfortunately. Um, now, their flat's in South London, but mm. this is a story you hear time and time again, mm. whether it's spiders, mm. rodents, ants, mould. Mm. I mean, you could go on with the list, but this is something you see replicated up and down the country in council housing. Yeah, absolutely, and I've been campaigning for the last um, three years on this issue alone, and my inbox or the DMs that I receive in emails... You're a busy man. It's just been getting busier and busier, yeah. and it's all four corners of the country. It's not just isolated to London. And, yes, it's really... In London, um, there's a high concentration of social housing properties, so we'd expect more complaints from there, but it's by far... It doesn't mean that it's um, just isolated to London. It's all four corners of the country. I mean, you've provided us <laughs> with some images that you've gathered as part of your evidence when yes. you're helping people with their cases, cos often these people go to their council and they're fobbed off mm. or the repairs are, de are delayed or they're just not done well enough, as in the case with Jordan and her yeah. daughter, Rayanne. What's your advice to people? Because thousands of people up and down the country, as you said, are in this mm. kind of situation right now and fighting, battling mm. to get decent living conditions off their local authority. Well, I, I think it absolutely starts with putting more pressure on our housing providers and social housing providers because mm. they have to take these complaints more seriously. I mean, in, in one case, I believe I sent the video in today of cockroaches, um, that resident had been complaining for 10 years, and then I went into the home and I filled, filmed in there, uploaded it to social media, and she was moved out within two days, I'd say, and she'd been complaining for 10 years. And there is a lack of um, proactiveness from social housing providers when it comes to infestations like this, and often they try to blame tenants and say, well, you have to deal with this yourself. But my advice to social housing tenants um, particularly is look at your tenancy agreement, because in there it should say that if infestations aren't just isolated to your home but your neighbours too, then it's mm -hmm. your landlord's responsibility. And I can tell you, in nine out of ten cases that I've been to, when it is vermin, bed bugs, uh, cockroaches, mice, when there is an infestation in one property, especially in flats, mm -hmm. you can almost guarantee that it's going to be in your neighbours' homes too. So you have to make sure that, you, first and foremost, you're speaking to your neighbours to find out and then making sure you highlight or um, make your provider, social housing provider, aware of it. If they are not doing that, mm -hmm. um, make formal complaints, and if they still don't deal with it then, um, my advice would be to go to the social housing ombudsman, but it shouldn't be for me as a campaigner to come in and have to disgrace a social housing provider yeah. into taking cases like this seriously, especially like in Jordan's situation where it resulted in her daughter being admitted to hospital with mm. sepsis. And sadly, we cover too many tragic cases here on Sky News. You know, mm. we've talked about... 
um, young children being affected by mould in council housing. And mm. as we know, the consequences can be fatal. Quajo, thank Absolutely. you. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you. You know, hopefully one day you'll be out of a job. But at the so. moment, you are very so. busy indeed. Thank you. And we have got a response uh, from the local authority, Wandsworth Council, in the case of uh, Jordan and Rayanne. Uh, their statement says, we are aware of a pharaoh ant infestation at this residence property and are using a pest control contractor. Uh, we have treated the property three times over the summer. We will continue to repeat the treatments until the problem has been dealt with. A number of repairs to the property are also in hand and while we carry out these repairs and treatments, we are offering the resident alternative accommodation so this situation can be resolved as quickly as possible. Uh, well, we here at Sky News wish uh, Rayanne a really speedy recovery. Uh, still to come on the UK tonight, uh, the convicted murderer whose actions during the London Bridge terror attack earned him a medal for bravery, which he has called a symbol of change on his journey to redemption. Hello, welcome back to the UK tonight. Now, in 2019, Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones were murdered by a convicted terrorist while working at a prisoner rehabilitation conference in London Bridge. Steve Galland, who himself was serving a life sentence for murder, was attending that conference on day release. In fact, it was his first day out of prison. After Jack and Saskia were stabbed, Steve helped to restrain their killer before the killer was shot and killed by police. Because of his actions that day, Steve was released early from prison and just last month he received the Queen's Gallantry Medal from the Princess Royal. And Steve joins me now in the studio. Steve, good to see you. Thank you so good much for you. coming in to talk to us. 
Well, we should start at the beginning, shouldn't we? That fateful day, the 29th of November 2019. Tell me how that day started, because I, I mentioned there the context of this was you were on day release, accompanied by a prison guard, mm -hmm. to attend an event offering education opportunities to offenders. That's how you find, found yourself in this situation. Yeah. Yeah, so as you can imagine, my first day out of prison, although I, was, I still had two and a half years left to serve, mm. I was in an open prison, and I'd been invited to Fishbangers all that day by Learn Together. And, yeah, I was, I was, I was happy, and I was my first taste of freedom. I was heading to London, the centre of London, to this beautiful building. Sun was shining, and I was surrounded by great people. You know, you, what a way to spend your first day out of prison. And about two hours into that conference, uh, screams cut through the air, which we know what happened after that. Yeah, that was the first indication that something was wrong. <laughs> Your prison guard went to investigate and yeah. told you to stay put. Mm -hmm. But you could hear what was going on and you decided to go downstairs and the scene that greeted you was chaos. What was happening? Well, yeah, I mean, I'd been told to stay put, but as the screams continued, I thought I'd best go and investigate. Mm -hmm. So I go downstairs and I see two young ladies laid on the floor, lots of blood coming from them, and clearly in a, in a terrible, terrible state. And I looked ahead of me and I saw husband Khan stood there with two eight-inch razor-sharp knives strapped to his hands. And I thought, well, clearly you're responsible for this. So I, as I've said before, I didn't hesitate. I, I, I took him on and my aim was really just to, to you know, keep him at bay, just to keep him occupied or take him to the ground until the police arrived. Just reading a quote from your book, because you've written about this, The Road to London Bridge, mm -hmm. It's your memoir, almost, you know, it's about more than what happened on that day. Yeah, it's the path that got mm -hmm. you there and the path afterwards. But you talk about the fact that you were being rehabilitated in prison and you made a vow. You were in prison for murdering someone. Yes. And once in prison, you made a vow never to commit an act of violence again. Yet you found yourself doing that on that day in defence of others. How did that sit with you? How did you feel? Well, I mean, you're right, I, I, I went to prison for committing a very serious offence and, and I lost a lot. I lost my freedom, I'd upset people. Um, I lost my freedom. So, yeah, I made, I made this vow to not use violence again and educate myself. Uh, so, yeah, coming to the, you know, the contrast between that initial offence and that, you know, saving someone's life is, is huge, isn't it? But I, I guess it just became... It's just become part of me, you know, that, that story. Is, it's just a decision I made and it was the right decision to make that day. So I capture it, you know, in, in this book in, in quite in some detail yeah. about what... You know, what, what happened and how I made that change whilst in the system. And Jack Merritt, one of the victims that day, you knew him well through his work in prison. In fact, he was one of the reasons you were there at Fishmongers Hall that day. Talk to me about Jack and, and the work he did. Yeah, so Jack was, yeah, just amazing, young, great-looking, characteristic guy. You know, he, was, he, was, he, he just had this ability to sort of make people feel a sense of self worth even prisoners, you know, lowly prisoners. And he just, he was just great. You know, he just had a natural talent for doing what he did and loved it. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, that's probably why it was so tragic how he, how he was killed doing the very thing that he loved doing. Mm -hmm. And it's because of Jack, you found yourself sort of going to this event, but also in prison working towards rehabilitating and, and finding redemption, mm -hmm. as it were. I mean, Talk to me about what life was like in prison, because on the UK tonight, we've talked extensively about mm -hmm. the state of prisons in the UK. They're not fit for purpose. You no, know, overstaffed, no. Um, understaffed, yeah. overcrowded. You saw cell fires, gang battles, mm -hmm. daily vi violence. What was it like living amongst that? How bad is it? It's, it's terrible. I mean, it, it was extremely challenging for me. And, but, you know, to, to, you, you can't engage in offending behaviour courses. You can't get to offending behaviour courses if you've got problems around you, if you've got enough, not enough staff to get you there, to get you to those education departments. So it's very, very difficult for people, even when they want to change. Mm. The system currently is just not really fit for purpose. Mm. And it's preventing that, that very important objective of rehabilitation. Mm. Uh, we're hearing it today on the news all the time. It's, it's, it's just not good enough and more needs to be done. You felt lucky then that day to be able to go um, to an event about rehabilitation and education of prisoners for after their release. Um, because of your actions that day, you were released early from uh -huh. prison. Um, you were reaching the end of it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you also received the Queen's Gallantry Medal. That's a medal for bravery from the Princess Royal just last month. And on that day, you called it a symbol 
for change. What did you mean by that? How did so, your life change by those events well, of the 29th? Yeah, for me, it wasn't just a, a recognition of that bravery that day. Um, this was recognised from the highest authority in the land. And I think if I was still committing offences, I still misbehaving. I, despite what happened that day, mm. I don't think I would have got that medal. So for me, it symbolises change as well. And um, from, I hope that what I've done, what I've achieved, can be used to inspire and motivate other people who might be struggling to, to change or want some inspiration. Mm. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very powerful thing for me, personally. What does change or redemption look like for you? Talk to me about what's been happening since 2019, the, the journey you've been on since then, because that's <clears throat> a seismic event <laughs> in yeah. your life. Enough has happened in your life yeah. already, and then this happens. Where did you go from there? Well, I mean, I'm currently working for the Howard League for Penal Reform as, as a fundraiser. We do a lot of work trying to improve the, the, the prison system and, mm. and probably get the numbers down and, and, and encourage the government to sort of, you know, put, put um, resources into the system which help people rehabilitate. But I'm also doing something else. Um, I'm currently the co-founder of Own Merit CIC, which is mm. a social enterprise that helps uh, prison leavers um, into a found accommodation and, um, uh, and employment as well. So I'm putting a lot of time and effort into helping other people who are coming out of prison to sort of reintegrate safely into society. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, when we talk about the UK prison system, understaffing, lack of resource, how hard is it for prisoners to get access to the tools that can help them if they want to change? Just give me a snapshot of that. You know, change comes from within. I think mm. if you really want to change, you know, you, you can, but I think currently the system, uh, it's not making that as easy as it should be. Mm. It shouldn't be hard to change, it should be easy. Yeah. And when prisons are understaffed in the way that they are, and people can't get to the, uh, the facilities which educate them, which, which rehabilitate them, which help them become better human beings, it's a very difficult task to achieve, mm. and it sh that shouldn't be like that. So it's not currently doing what it should be doing, I think. I think the public deserve a lot more. OK, Steve, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us on the UK tonight. That's Steve Gallant there. Uh, the Road to London Bridge is his uh, memoir of what has happened and his journey so yeah. far, your journey to redemption. Steve, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, bear with me for just a moment because you're not suddenly tuning into the Antiques Roadshow. Um, our next story, however, wouldn't look out of place on it. A marble sculpture bought for £5 by a local council has just been valued by a potential buyer at not one but £2.5 million. Pounds. The local authority in Scotland is holding a meeting on Monday to decide if they want to go boom or bust. Uh, well, joining me now is Maxine Smith from the Highland Council. Maxine, what a predicament um, the council members are going to find themselves in on Monday because that's a huge amount of money. First of all, talk to me about the sculpture, where it came from, because it was lost for many years and you happened to find it. Um, yeah, well, it dates back to the 1700s. So it's Sir John Gordon of Invergordon. He was the founder of the town of Invergordon um, and he was also an MP in those days. So the sculpture was um, commissioned and it was created by Edmé Bouchardon. Um, he's a French sculptor. So I didn't know anything about the bust, but I wondered um, way back in 1998 as a community councillor where all the previous provost robes were and the provost chains. Um, so I started to make inquiries. Um, a local councillor at the time, Andy Anderson, said, try the little shed um, down at the little village called Ballantour. And I said, you mean the little scout hut next to the football pitch? He said, yes, I thought that was very strange. Um, so like my treasure hunt. Care, caretaker, yeah, I got the caretaker to come down and um, it was just a padlock on the door on the outside. So we went in and there was another door as we went inside and there was this white thing on the floor holding it open as if it was like a doorstop. So I ignored that and carried on straight away, found the provost robes, found the chains and was really excited. And then I saw some pictures that I thought might be worth something still ignoring the sculpture on the floor. Um, but then I took photos of everything. Um, and in those days, we, we didn't have the, the cameras on the phone, so it was a digital camera. And when I sent them off, um, somebody said, I wonder what that is on the floor. So I started looking into it, and everything was re removed out of this shed um, into another council building for safety. And somebody said, that's a sculpture of Sir John um, Gordon, of Inver Gordon. 
So, um, so the doorstop was actually the bus that we're looking at. <laughs> yeah, that is the bus. I, and in really good condition. I mean, look at it. So over you know, about 250 years old and it's amazing. So, um, so you bought it back essentially for a fiver from the Scout yeah. Heart. So, no, um, it was actually bought for a fiver in 1931. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. So the contents of the Scout Heart you got back for free. So originally it started out as a fiver. Um, yeah. It's now could be worth two and a half million pounds, maybe more, because you've had a potential buyer come forward. So talk to you about the dilemma you're in right now. So um, all those years, we, first of all, we had to establish ownership, and that's why we know mm. it was bought for Fiverr in 1931, because we found the old community council minutes, and apparently it was in an old stately home um, near Invergordon on the Kindice estate, and so they were assigned the contents of that house for auction. And so the community council were given permission to bid up to a fiver. So they got it. So then it, it became um, possession of the actual um, provost at that time. Um, yeah, so on Monday, what we've got to decide is whether we go to consultation with the local community in a bid to sell it. So basically, we'll be saying to the 3,800-ish residents of Invergordon, do you want to sell this treasure or do you want to keep it? But... At the moment, keeping it, it's in storage and it's locked away in a safe because we can't afford to put it on display because it's too expensive. Exactly. We can't insure so it. The instinct so, might be to cash in if they can't see yeah. it. Imagine what £2.5 million pounds would do for the local community. Um, what a dilemma. I don't envy uh, you on Monday, Maxine, but thank you very much for coming on to tell us the story. We will update our viewers on Monday whether you decide to go boom or bust. Thank you, Maxine. Oh, thank you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. What a story that is. Um, coming up on the UK tonight, a blow for Newcastle. Their big summer signing at Sandro Tonali is banned for 10 months plus. When we lost John, we knew that it was really over. I was talking to Yoko and she said, oh, I think I've got a tape of John. Paul called me up and said he'd like to work on Now and Then. He put the the Beatles are back, well, sort of. Uh, we'll bring you all the details we have on what is being dubbed their last song. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soa murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. <laughs> Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey.
hello, welcome back to the UK tonight. Coming up, more on the return of the Beatles. I can't tell you now because that is a really hard act <laughs> for even David Garrido to I, follow. I will do my very, very best. <laughs> it could be the warm-up act for the Beatles. Happy, my goodness, I would, I would set up for that. <laughs> I really would. So, um, let's talk about Newcastle. should stop laughing because this is no <laughs> laughing matter. A massive blow for them too. It, yes, it really is. It's the, the news we were expecting, SJ, because Sandra Tonali, big summer signing for them, £55 million from AC Milan, uh, has been banned from football for 10 months. This is because he, he, well, he admitted to mm. betting on matches while he was an AC Milan player. It means that he will miss the rest of the season for Newcastle. If Italy qualify for the Euros, he will miss that as well. Mm. Now, he can train, he can play in friendlies, and originally this ban was going to be 18 months, but it's only 10 because, actually, the last eight, he will be giving talks to young footballers, having gone through treatment sessions for problem gamblers mm -hmm. himself. A lot of support from the PFA, a lot of support also uh, from Newcastle themselves, as you might well expect. Uh, plenty more to come, though, in terms of the other sporting stories of the evening. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Just sum up what it means to you to be part of a team that is the first Arab team to go to a Women's World Cup? You know, sometimes I still need to pinch myself of the journey that I've been on. Um, the last year has been incredible, obviously international-wise. Um, as you said, we're the first Arab team to qualify for the Women's World Cup. Um, it's been an incredible time for the country, um, for Arab women, for Arab women in sport. And, you know, I think it's massive and Sometimes I really need to take a step back and actually look at what we've achieved because, you know, sometimes I can't put it into words. So it's been a real journey and one that I'm, I'm going to be proud of for the rest of my life. I wanted to play on the international stage um, and for everyone that knows me, they know how much of a special place Morocco is for me. Um, and, you know, it was just a choice that I thought I haven't got long left in my football career. The pride that my Moroccan family have, even my mum's family who are Scottish, the pride that they have um, for me playing for Morocco, I, I can't replicate that for anything else. And yeah, anyone that knows me knows how special it is for me to put on a Moroccan shirt. I think I've always had a close connection with my dad's side of the family. I've been going to Morocco as long as I can remember. Um, but it feels extra special when you're putting on that country shirt, you know, you learn so much about the culture, being in and around the other girls who are living in Morocco. Um, you learn about the heritage even more, the religion. There's so many aspects about Morocco that, you know, I thought maybe I knew before I played for Morocco, but I'm just learning more and more. Every time I go on a camp, it's amazing for me. And, you know, it's um, something that I'm so glad that I did just because the impact that we're having for women in Morocco. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Time now for a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Widespread showers or longer spells of rain through this weekend and strong winds in the north and the south. Many places fine this evening, but there will be prolonged rain in the northeast, mostly over the flooded parts of Scotland and a scattering of showers elsewhere. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And now some good news to end the programme tonight. The Beatles are releasing a new song. The tune is called Now and Then. It was written and sung by John Lennon, but it was always considered too poor quality to use. That is, until now. When we lost John, we knew that it was really over. I was talking to Yoko and she said, ah, oh, I think I've got a tape of John. Paul called me up and said he'd like to work on Now and Then. He put the bass on, I put the drums on. It's the last song that my dad and Paul and George and Ringo will get to make together. How lucky was I to have those men in my life? Now I know what you're thinking, where's the song? Well, the Beatles are making us wait another seven days to hear it. The track is going to be released next Thursday and we promise we will bring it to you then. Uh, well, that's all from the UK tonight. You can catch up on the highlights on our webpage. Just scan the QR code on your screen. You can share your thoughts with us as well. We'll see you next Monday at 8 o'clock.